Good evening, everybody, and welcome at the Institute of Architecture at the Lucerne University of Applied Science and Arts, where we are right now. You can see it in my background. This is our second talk on materialisms, where we would like to expand our current perspective on materialities in architecture, which traditionally mainly included the architectural view. And of course, it's one thing to know about those truisms of multidisciplinary views and alternatives in material history. The other thing is to learn how we can integrate them into the future planning of architecture and what it could mean for our teaching and also the practice of architects. Because of course, it's one thing, not, it's not enough to only understand those new relationships. We also eventually, eventually need to implement them. So our talk tonight with Nikolaus Hirsch, Arno Brandlhuber, who is still on transit, but will join later, Olaf Gravert and Antje Stahl, Will take us to the Venice to will take us to Venice to the German Pavilion of the Architecture Biennial. We are in the year of 2038, where we will have a look back into the past, and by then we finally have no problems anymore. And instead of asking questions, the year of 2038 will be able to give answers also to our current material crisis. And now I will start shortly to to introduce everybody. I will start with Antje because I know her best. <laughs> Antje is a writer and journalist based in Berlin and Zurich. She used to be the head of architecture dossier um, for Neue Zürcher Zeitung. And currently she's teaching architecture criticism at ETH Zurich. She will moderate the talk and also knows the office Brandhuber Plus and now B Plus since forever. That's what she told me. And she also has just wrote a big text for the magazine 2G about the office. And then the big curatorial team this Nikolaus Hirsch, Olaf Gravert and Anno Brandhuber um, curated 2038 and all of them also have their own practice. Olaf and Anno in Berlin with B plus as well. They are teaching at the ETH in Zurich. And Nicolas Hirsch is the director of SIVA in Brussels and was the dean at Städel Schule. And he's also an author of several books and co-founder of Reflux Architecture. So thank you all from far away and close for coming. And also let's start the conversation now. Antje. Yeah, thank you so much, Heike. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I don't know if you know this, but we don't see you. Um, I only see Olaf, Heike, and Nikolaus um, in my screen. So um, I hope um, you will enjoy this uh, talk. Um, thank you so much for inviting us and inviting me to um, moderate this conversation. We decided we're going to go for a conversation in English first, because I think there are a lot of um, guests joining tonight um, who are English speakers. Um, we just started uh, talking to each other in German like for the past half an hour. So excuse me if I sometimes might lack a word here and there. Um, yeah, so um, we talk about, so the lecture series that Heike just introduces, apparently obviously called materialism. And um, tonight uh, behind the materialism, there's a number um, 2038. Um, which is uh, a date, um, a year, um, a number. That is also the title of the German pavilion um, of the 17th International Architecture uh, Biennale of Venice that was postponed, as we all know, um, due to the COVID-19 crisis um, to next year. Um, so um, here we are, there's a window, um, I guess, I hope that you all see, um, which is called F and A, so for questions and answers. We're gonna integrate the questions that you might have, the critics, the comments um, in this conversation. So please feel free to um, you know, use the chat window. Um, Heike and I are gonna look at it um, and try to integrate it in the, in the conversation. We're gonna talk for about one hour, I, I guess, um, and then the, for the uh, rest, the last 30 minutes, um, we hope to, that we can all um, have like a joint forces um, also with your comments and um, uh, yeah, your comments in this little window. Um, 
So I would pass, li like to pass on immediately, obviously, to the uh, protagonists of tonight, the curators, um, uh, Olaf Gravert and Nicolas Sirsch, who are part of the curators team for uh, the German Pavilion 2038. And I believe, Olaf, you have uh, brought something. Uh, you're going to share your screen to show us something as an introduction. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. We start with a little video with a short clip. Uh, about 10 minutes, which is kind of like a trailer for the project itself, and maybe the best starting point to immediately like get an idea what we are doing and how the project actually is built up. So I will share the screen. <clears throat> Let's start. Nobody could have imagined that this would ever grow out of that crisis, but it did. Um, you know, Barack Obama, when he ran for president in the United States, said, if we don't take up the fight, the fight to change the way politics works, then real change, change that will make a lasting difference in the lives of ordinary Americans, will keep getting blocked by the defenders of the status quo. When he said that, I thought, it will always be blocked. That change will never happen. Nobody will take up that fight. But it was forced upon us and we took it up and astonishingly, we made it happen. We went from a model that was top down with authoritarian kind of governments, uh, with a central bank that is completely opaque, producing private money that does not really invest into what people really need, to a model that is bottom up, where people are using currency, data, city infrastructures to create this kind of green feminist digital cities that really uh, work for the many and that really enable. Um, this kind of radical democracy that we are living in today. We the people have changed. We the people now do what we want to do and take responsibility for where we are. We developed a society not obsessed with competition. So we forgot competition as one of our main core values and goals. And instead, we re-embrace the values that we had before. Solidarity, cooperation, engaging in activities that are not driven by expectations of profitability, for example. Right now we have 20 spaces and we have a big community of up citizens. So the up city uh, projects at the beginning was just an utopia to propose an alternative to the smart city, official smart city project, and prove that you can have smart cities by help people to become smart. 
So my pod is like a digital peacekeeper. Uh, we made a uh, space where everybody can share their reflections on what the problem is. And instead of talking about how to fix it, we first have people share what they mean by fixing it, what they feel about fixing it, and so on, so that we have a common map of the issues at hand. And very quickly, people understood that there are certain pathways that are very thin, that are very difficult, but that's the only way out of the wicked problem. Some of the innovations that have scaled out of uh, Africa, particularly East Africa, are one, participatory systems of government where crowdsourcing and on the ground um, participation of citizens is not limited to election cycles. Back in, in 2020, we had this mainstream understanding of something is um, ecologically valuable if it saves energy. So if it has the minimal interaction with the outside. So that where all these uh, isolated boxes came from. You can remember these classical architectural forms with thick walls uh, where nothing should go through. But this was the main focus, like a... a a strict corridor and um, you have to protect the building from the environment and you have to protect the inside to lose energy to the outside and this um was i mean that was that was actually hundreds of years yes it was the tradition of architecture to protect us from from the surrounding from the nature and but it came to a certain peak until it collapsed, until we understood. Yeah, when they had to tear these houses down and had yeah. to recycle all this plastic, and then they realized it's, it's no use. You know, it, actually, it's a system, and we can't close the circle. It's not possible. Okay, so, you know, back in 2019, everybody was running around saying, the robots are coming, the robots are coming, they're taking all of our jobs. Well, from the perspective of 2038, that was completely wrong. The robots turned out to be our friends. They turned out to do things for us that we couldn't do on our own. They work together to help us accomplish things that we need to get done. So robots are your friend. They are our friends, and we love having them around. During some time, architects, for some reason, thought that architecture were only about the things that you see. But since... since Alberti, we all know that architecture is the masterful jointing of, of uh, putting things together, huh? which is architectonics. And in a way, this is very similar to computer science and is very similar to what happens in the digital. So I think as an architect, I, I never felt before my profession to be so relevant. Some of the keys ended up being first making AI compact enough, making artificial intelligence and machine learning models small enough that they could actually run on devices uh, and in people's own presence, in their own spheres, so that the number of AIs multiplied and it became not just something that, that ran only in a very small number in data centers with uh, giant aggregations, but something that, that really went out into the world, became part of people's own internal ecologies and their relationships with each other. And in, in that process, um, the, the social contracts between people, their data, and the Internet of Things as well, really changed in very constructive ways. And you know, in, in now, in 2038, we can actually connect to each other just with a click right here. I have a new implant, it works pretty well. It's open source, also I can just like upgrade the firmware with Tenroom and, and talk to someone else in this room, like know who is close, know who is on the other side. And so it becomes pretty delicate. I mean, we have a fast speed of connection. And then, um, you know, it's, I'm very happy that at a certain point we took responsibility and we did not left it in the hands of multinational corporations that just want to profit from the activities of our brains. So enjoy 2038 and don't forget to have also some sports and some dance because the music right now is awesome. Stop here for a second with first questions, Antje and Heike, or shall I continue a little bit and talk about the process and the project?
Yeah, I would. So thanks. Uh, there was a lot of information, obviously. Um, I think we all got an idea that um, a lot of uh, uh, agents just talk to us uh, from like a visionary future, I suppose. Um, and uh, a lot of terms, you know, I heard a lot of terms, competition, profit, uh, robots, you know, so maybe you could uh, first start uh, maybe a little bit more basic like what was the initial idea like why why do we need 2038 yeah and why 2038 i mean why is it why why exactly 2038 and not 2031 so like is it okay nico that i continue and then sure, sure go ahead yeah okay share the screen again and then we always have like a little information uh, to see so um I mean, find also the information online. No? So we have like a statement, of course, as a curatorial team and a long list of people participating, which I think you already saw in this first trailer, um, that the project is also about bringing together like all these different voices from a future perspective, like these experts from very different fields, amongst them also architects, but also a lot of different uh, disciplines. And the, the basic idea of the project is to put ourselves like in this future 2038 into a close future so the idea was not to choose like a year that is so far away um, that we don't feel kind of like the responsibility to it um, so I think if you talk about 2050 a lot of people immediately start asking themselves how old am I in 2050 um, is it still like a relevant uh, age to me or like a year to me um, I think that 2038 we chose the year um, back then also because it was meant to be then a year of the biennial, also a very uh, special year to the German pavilion, um, 100 years after it was opened again um, in a very particular political situation, of course, and to say 100 years later, we have managed the big crisis and 100 years later, we actually look back to the recent past and we see how all these models, also architectural models, contributed to like a world in which the system functions for almost like 100% of society. Yeah. So I think there's like a difference in, in the introduction that Heike did um, and the way we put it also, as you saw it in the trailer in the end, not everything works, no, we cannot solve every human drama. People are still sad and um, have relationship problems. And uh, things like this so we cannot solve all the problems but um, we say in 2038 the system which is like the underlying system of how we live together how wealth is distributed which is also the question of the biennial how will we live together um, has changed significantly and architects have been part of this uh, solutions that we found um, also I think maybe, that maybe, maybe yeah. something to add here um, is um, to expand on, on what Olaf said is, I think for us, the, this kind of maneuver to construct some kind of a review from 2038 to 2020 was also a way to, um, to somehow escape certain um, problems, I think, in how you construct utopias. That's, it's only one directional, so it's a kind of narrative that works in a different direction from 2038 backwards, um, trying to explain a process. And I think so we, we try to weave in certain elements from different areas, whether it's housing or ecology, technology, et cetera, to weave in, in, in this kind of narrative that works from 2038 backwards. And, and um, when I mentioned utopia, it's, I think from, from today's perspective in 2020 and also last year when we started the work um, it would have been probably more appropriate and easier to um, describe rather dystopia and because I think this I think our discourse in architecture is also full of of course descriptions of very urgent problems of something when you put it into the future are more in the realm of, of a dystopia. And I think that was, uh, for us, uh, it was a clear motivation to say, well, no, we want something where architects together with other disciplines are actually part of a solution. 
So it's more trying to develop a, a rather optimistic view and also maybe refer back to a role of architects that are more implemented in uh, societal processes than more maybe if perhaps like in the heroic 1920s, partly I mean, if you look at city administration, et cetera. So I think that was for us a very important motivation to uh, to step away from, from these uh, ongoing very dystopic descriptions of the world. Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting, I think, also because, I mean, obviously, you immediately think of, you know, science fiction, um, especially, um, you know, once you envision like a certain kind of future. Um, what I find interesting in this approach as well is that, um, you know, today, if you look at politics, for example, politics that try to change something, it's, it usually is um, communicated through something like you, you, you're not allowed to do certain things anymore, right? So if you want to improve the future, you, are you have to prevent a lot of things. So it's, it's ex negative often, yeah. I think, in politics. So that, that was also something I wondered. So you, you, your starting point is something like hope, I guess, um, or like, a, yeah, like some, something incredibly optimistic, um, right? Yeah, definitely. I think they're like, also, as Nico said, there are two ways. You, know, you can. We also did an interview with Bruce Sterling, the like the amazing science fiction author, and he was kind of like uh, saying, "But why should I? But when everything is good in 2038, what, what, what's the effort? What's the struggle?" You no. Know? And he said, "Like, why don't you put it like a, as a dystopia, kind of like an engine to change because we are afraid of what comes next?" Um, but I think that the approach we have is definitely a positive one, saying, "Okay." let's frame it as a world that you want to achieve and show it in the pavilion through film and tell the story of it actually like create a world that you want to enter and architecture is part of it sometimes it's only the backdrop sometimes it's like a very essential part of this positive future how we ended up there um, and let's show how it could be and by showing how it or how it will be people say okay we are willing to collaborate, we are willing to achieve this. And all these optimistic views or models that we present in 2038 are all rooted in things that we actually observe now. You know? So this is kind of like, I mean, the project developed out of a, like a longer collaboration. You see so many interesting models where architecture is not only like a finished object or a box, where architecture is way more in terms of like how it's economically built, whether it be Genossenschaften or the meat sources syndicate, there are so many examples or what we will talk about circular economy or the topic of cohabitation. So there are all these like seeds or topics around us that are super interesting where we would say, okay, these things will lead to a change if they are integrated in this like narrative of telling a positive future and how asking the experts, how will we end up there? No. So this is like also the the, the trick, the task that we ask the people who are working in this field right now. So all the people in the trailer are like experts already in their field. But if you change the question and say, you are now in 2038, tell me what happened so that we ended up in this world. It changes immediately the answer and people get very specific. They don't talk about options. They actually talk about solutions. And then it's kind of like the, maybe the curatorial task or especially in film it's also the editing task um how you can like kind of collect these statements or how do you bring them together that the narrative becomes um plausible was was there a strategy how you selected those projects or did you just um know or, i mean you have a lot of you got you you have collected many many alternative projects for the year 2038 yeah there was an there was like of there was a strategy there was so there was like this one strategy when we applied we applied already with a very big team so the application was already let's do this project and these are the 30 people that we would be interested in um collaborating with without knowing that everyone would agree that they would collaborate with us no but we knew a big part of them um, and then we, of course, did like um, internal discussions and kind of like defined premises how 2038 will look like. You know? So we said to ourselves, okay, these things are the reality in 2038. 
how could we get there? And then it was kind of a mix also asking uh, people who we interviewed, whom would you recommend? And also, because otherwise you're always in danger that you call your telephone book and always ask the people that are similar to you and might agree anyways, because you're part of the same bubble. So at a certain point, it kind of like started developing itself. And a lot of the people you also saw in the trailer were recommendations by people we interviewed first. And then we got more and more into this research, kind of like who are the people uh, to talk to, which I think turned but, out to be like yeah. a very interesting strategy. But of course, we, um, I think besides those people we, we contacted, we in parallel were looking for particular themes and topics. And uh, whether, for instance, in the trailer, you, you saw Audrey Tang, um, the, um, the Taiwanese uh, yeah, expert minister for digital democracy to a certain extent, which we thought is, is a topic that's absolutely crucial when we think about new models of democ not only democracy, but also planning in our cities and, and uh, countrysides as well. So, uh, so just to take that example, or uh, Francesca Bria, which is also a similar field of uh, this relation between technology and democracy. And then there are other topics that are maybe closer to classical architecture that you saw where um, with uh, Ludwig and Schönland from Munich. So, um, so in that sense, we had certain topics on our chart to a certain extent and try to move forward along certain topics. And now we try to weave everything uh, together to a certain extent. Yeah, and before we dive into um, concrete uh, proposals um, that you uh, curated and, um, and um, uh, what do you say, um, yeah, that you, that you uh, reached out for, um, no. I would maybe first um, <laughs> like, to, so we saw a film, obviously, it's like one medium that you chose. Um, the other medium you chose is a newspaper, and um, maybe you could introduce these two mediums and also explain um, why in 2038 we are still with these quite old uh, uh, media? Uh, yeah, why did you choose this, and um, how do you convey the stories, you know, through the medium? Um, because obviously, as my some of you might know, um, Olaf is part of the uh, Brandenburger Studio as well at ETH, where film is also very central to your teaching. So, um, and I remember when you started back in 2017, um, you know, there was a very very big claim that the film might you know, bring the revolution basically back to our, uh, yeah, living rooms. Uh, weirdly enough, we are all sitting in our living rooms now. But so maybe you could explain a bit the, ch the choice of the medium before we dive into the concrete uh, projects. Mm -hmm. I think like for the for the medium of film, and you also mentioned it, that right. we use it in, uh, in our chair or in our studio at ETH. I think it's always like this idea whether it's TV, whatever you call TV today, no, I think we all agree that um, this happens also online. I think the most interesting thing of, um, in TV is that it's linear and that someone decides for you, kind of curates the story and tells it in a linear way. So you're kind of willing, if you watch it and don't zap away, no? you're willing to watch a narrative and a story that someone else is constructing for you and you're willing to dive into this world and it's a similar approach we have in 2038 and we try with the students um, so there's like a lot of expertise at ETH um, in classical architecture teaching which is extremely important this is nothing that we would ever question but as an additional offer to the existing teaching meth methods we decided that um, the idea of creating films or videos where you are obliged to write a story and decide what you show like all the clips are very short also the way the trailer for 2038 was cut. It's like these very short um, statements which allow you to construct like a world and a narrative in itself. So this is also the task that we try to do with the students um, to actually ask them to take a position and define their own topic and then decide how they construct the narrative and the story in this very short clips. So it's this idea of being able to describe a system and architecture which is then the background of all our living. So architecture always plays like an essential role 
um, in the films that also the students produce. Um, and you also mentioned the second medium, which is the newspaper. I will share my screen again so uh, to show you actually the, the, the newspaper. So um, what we did, and you see here the cover is um, for the publication of the biennial. So you classically do a publication for the pavilion. No, you are also asked to do this. Um, we looked again into like collaborative models because we said, okay, ideally we find similar positions or people who think the same way and we don't have to invent everything ourselves. So um, of course you can do like a classical book that is beautiful with a great publishing house. But the question is also always how far does this reach out or how much does it stay in your bubble? Um, and I think it's like a great, um, a great opportunity to do the biennial and the pavilion. That's also the reason why we applied, of course, but we always said, okay, we actually would uh, like to reach out to more people than only the people who are in Venice. I mean, there are like a lot of people in Venice, of course, but it's still like a very classical audience, no, architecture related. Um, and what we found in Berlin, which is amazing, is a street journal. So this is like a Straßenzeitung. It's sold um, on the street by street vendors. So everyone is basically allowed to sell it. It has like a very interesting economic model behind. So the three people who set it up it's a two years old project um, by three great people, Maria Ines, Alina Kula, and Paul Sochaki. I think they should be mentioned. And they decided to do this um, street channel and say, okay, we want to produce a newspaper that finances itself. And the moment the 30,000 copies are printed, they can give it away to homeless people or people who want to sell it. And all the money you earn with the newspaper stays with the people who sell it. Um, it's like a very well-known concept in Germany. It does not exist in all countries. And we decided to do one newspaper together with them from 2038. So it was meant to be published in, uh, at the Viennis Biennial in May. So it also has like an Italian cover. And um, we actually produced maybe not a very classical publication for a biennial, but a medium that allows you to construct a whole world in 2038. So the whole newspaper is based in 2038 and has like these different fragments, um, like with stills from the films, but like with texts, partly interviews, we transcribed and edited also from the films, a lot of articles that were written from a 2038 perspective from people, um, also with advertisement that finances the newspaper. So there's like an advertisement from the uh, Arbeiterkammer, I don't know the English word, Chamber of Workers, um, that say in uh, 2038 you still need uh, justice and someone fighting for workers. So it's kind of like a medium um, and Heike also asked to get copies for your school that allows you to construct basically like a whole world. So it's like a newspaper in 2038. Nico, do you want to add something to... You're muted. No, please, please continue. Okay, okay. yeah. So it's, uh, so it's this newspaper from basically from the future with these different formats and also kind of like fake advertisements from the future. And it has like these four kind of like core architectural projects inside, um, which are like the thematical structure in a way of the newspaper itself with all the articles and written stories around it. And like we decided to talk about basically two examples that are also in the newspaper that today the topic of circular economy and materialism and the topic of uh, cohabitation so that's kind of like the newspaper um, how it is sold since july so we we did not postpone it until next year we decided to sell it already on the streets and it was kind of like an interesting experiment that you would also walk on the streets in berlin and when you were sitting in a bar outside that then the street vendors would pass by and ask you, do you want to buy kind of like the, 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 yeah, the magazine. And it also had like an interesting moment because Arts of the Working Class, um, so the, the newspaper Arts of the Working Class, they always do these meetings with the street vendors. No? So the street vendors, the people on the street have to understand what they are kind of like selling. So it's also like an interesting moment that you have to 
translate your ideas in different languages and tell people how they should kind of like advertise it. No? So when they approach you and say, do you want to buy the magazine? And then someone says like, what is the magazine about? And then all by a sudden you start a dialogue with a non-architect about the biennial and the future year of 2038. Just like a, a, a different channel that widens the audience. Mm -hmm. Like because of COVID-19, I think it was an, a, a great moment that the pavilion for us started with the newspaper and the films that you could watch online, like on the streets and one year before, and then will continue in the pavilion. I think in that sense also, um, film and, and, uh, and this kind of journal, I think it, it's not a contradiction, uh, referring back to your question on that, that to a certain extent they're complementary, and we don't think that in 2038, everything is just flat like the screen in which um, in front of which we are sitting right now um, we think that that uh, basically printed material will still exist and um, you will still have similar distribution channels but they will, will be very different and we have to think about new models of distribution as well i think this is also an attempt to test um, these ideas uh, on the occasion of the Biennale. Yeah, I mean, speaking of which, uh, printed material is still going to exist. It's it's interesting, you know, how um, so in the film, you know, we we have a, more of a simulated architecture, I guess. You know, you bring it back to the real world with the newspaper, which is a, still even today almost a nostalgic medium. Um, mm. But then, um, uh, also Olaf, you mentioned um, that you are you, you're kind of falling, falling. You have felt in love almost, you know, with the linear uh, uh, narrative um, that you know you are able to tell a story basically through film. Um, and um, so, one of the topics that you chose um, for tonight as well that we uh, that you're going to present as part of the solution to all our problems, to a lot of problems that we face today, um, is, um, it has a title uh, which is From Linear to Circular Economy. Maybe you could introduce us to this idea. What does that mean? I'm muted. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, it's like very complex. No? Also, the newspaper kind of puts you in the position to make it linear again. No? So you have like all these knowledge and then you sit there and the, the graphic designers are doing the layout and you have to decide the order. So you're also in the newspaper confronted with this moment to put it like in a linear um, order as you have to do it in the films. And one of the interviews we did, which is also in the newspaper and it's also like we put it online as a PDF so people could download it from our website also after the talk and read it um, is one interview we did with um, an architectural office from the Netherlands. Um, we found the approach very interesting and we think that um, their way of thinking, especially also their way of like um, pragmatic acting and approach is very interesting because they actually propose a different system which would mean a drastic change, but the way they introduce it is not at all naive or idealistic it's like very hands-on which is kind of like um, a relief um, in this utopian thinking the way they argue with legislation and economic models um, is very plausible and they already work in this field for years um, their name is um, Thomas Rau and Sabine Oberhuber I always mix the names um, the office is called turn two um, and we present I share my screen again. So it's in the newspaper as an as an interview, but then it's also um, so this is the article you can find on our website. Was kostet die Welt? It's in German, and the second page on their approach, describing with diagrams and very um, easygoing one project they did, and um, we also have it here. So the basic idea. What they present is they say we have to rethink the way we design architecture and we think about it. They frame it as product as a service. I translated this German now in English. Um, there's also like a book uh, from them um, in German and in English. And I took 
some quotes from the interview we did, which I think is like very interesting um, to think about how circular economy could influence the way we um, design architecture and build. So one of the first things they introduce is like two very basic things, um, thoughts. One is that the debate about the scarcity of resources is a misunderstanding because all resources are limited. So a lot of the sustainability discussions we have today they would say are kind of like a misunderstanding because we always talk about stop using material or saving material because there is a scarcity, but actually it's not a scarcity, it's like a limitation. So if we understand this and change our thinking, we immediately realize that um, all of the material we will sooner or later run out, which has like very specific concrete consequences for architectural projects. And the second idea, which I think a lot of people would agree is that architecture is a temporary response to a temporary need. So they say whatever we do in architecture, it's always only like a temporary spatial answer to a temporary need we might have now. So the need is changing, so the architecture should be able to change as well. And this in combination with like the first premise of knowing that the material, that we will run out of the material, leads to a complete different way of understanding how to actually use material in architecture. So the way they work is that they proactively design in a way that the building could be taken apart, dismantled and used again. So it changes a lot because the way they design, they immediately work with the companies who would tell them, well, let's do the wooden beam 10% thicker and it's maybe too thick for your building now but afterwards we can use it for 10 times more projects because it's just 10 percent thicker and i think that's like an interesting moment for architects who then might be obsessed with the thinness of a column to realize that if you overcome this form thinking or like complete obsession with the perfection of the object it leads to a different design and to a different economic understanding and use of the material. And what they introduce, and you also find it then in the newspaper, it's from their book, is like a very specific model where they actually talk about the idea that the material is always used by the people who mine the material. So the person who mines the material in whichever country is basically the owner of the material and the resource, and then it's only passed on to the next level. So the idea is that in the end, when you get like a finished product, like for instance, a lamp, you're always able or allowed to give it back and the producer, the company has to take it back. And there's like a very pragmatic, like architectural anecdote. Um, so they did a design for a headquarter of a company and they said, we don't want to buy the lamp for this building. We want to buy light, like the service of the service of the lamp, no light. And they approached the companies and said, okay, the task is a different one. We don't ask you to deliver the best lamp. We ask you to deliver light to our table. And the companies were totally confused and said like, what, what are you doing? Why do you change the premise? Why don't you buy the product? And they said, because we are only interested in the service and ask you to deliver the service. And we always want to be able to give back the lamp. And what happened is that after five months, the lamp company actually approached them with a prototype of a lamp that would never, like, how do you say, never break, never run out. So only by changing the basic question as an architect, not saying, I want to have the lamp, I want to have the service of light the company all by a sudden responded with a product that could deliver the service. And it's like this whole discussion about <clears throat> um, sense, like the moment where a product breaks, although it would function longer as an economic decision. And that's kind of like the interesting moment where they as architects proactively change the brief. And I think that's very interesting to understand that by changing the brief, like the basic yeah. task, which we are able as architects to do, you can influence the economic like life cycle and system a lot. And this is maybe also um, where 
um, these approaches are clearly linked to questions of legislation and and norms, etc. Because <clears throat> we we think that architects in the future, uh, from the perspective of twenty thirty eight, will have to enter these areas of politics and legislation in order to implement, together with engineers, this kind of circular economy. Because uh, we expect nobody or very few people will just do it on their own. And that's why uh, we think that also, I think that's certainly something interesting for uh, education also, and universities of architecture, that the fields that sound very unattractive today um, because apparently not design related, slightly unsexy, that they, they are probably the fields where, um, the where in the future this will be incredibly interesting. I think this is really where creativity is needed. Maybe less uh, regarding a facade, whether it looks like this or like that. Yeah, I mean, um, obviously, this, these are all questions that, you know, immediately um, come to mind. Um, maybe you can specify and or clarify um, a little bit what the difference of their approaches to things we already know, like recycling. And what does it mean to um, kind of be able to dismantle and reuse um, the material that has been um, uh, built in a, in a building? Um, because obviously, you, you know, um, when you think of architecture, you think then only, especially when you think about design process on modular systems, for example. Um, maybe you can explore, explore a bit um, these, these questions. Hmm. I don't, yeah, I don't think it's like modular only, because I fully agree that when you hear this, you immediately think, okay, I got it. I know what I have to do as an architect. It's modular now again. So it's like partially that. It's not that they would say you're not allowed to or we should not ever build um, with concrete anymore. It's just like the right moment when to use which material, no? This is how I would approach it. So also the use of concrete might be resourceful if we think about structures that should be there like as kind of like the framework for a long term. And also the discussion about the sustainability of concrete has to do something with like material innovation how can we kind of like develop concrete as a material and don't stick with the concrete we already have at hand and use it because it can do anything we want. So this is like one discussion. Um, the difference they have in terms of like recycling is um, they developed like a platform. It's called Madasta. It's a computer program. They developed it with over 30 institutions um, and the program actually lists all the material you use. So the idea is when you build a house as a developer, all the material you use to build this one building is uh, fully listed. And you as a developer always know how much you own as a material. Because the problem why we don't do this now is that we think we can, what is abschreiben? Um, that we can calculate a certain time span for a product or a building. Yeah. And let's say after 10 years, it's worth nothing. So after yeah. 10 years, we say, what well, like, or after five years, the computer is worth nothing. And they say, this is like a complete perversion, which I would fully agree that after five years, the, the, the computer is still valuable because the material always keeps its value. So it has like a very, also because Sabine Oberhuber is an economist, so it's like a combination of an architect and she's an economist. They always understand that material can never lose its value. So it immediately changes the equation. No, it changes the way you calculate. Because if you get rid of this idea that after a certain time span, it's worth nothing, which is ridiculous, you change the use of material immediately. Because also if I have now a cup here, and I throw the cup away now in the trash. For me, all of a sudden it's trash, but it's still, it's still a cup. You know, like our understanding of throwing things away and in this moment it loses the identity and the value, this has to change. So there's like a very different understanding of recycling and they do this, maybe this to add it, they do it like in two phases. So they do it um, once 
for newly built things, which they then talk about like a depot. So it's only like a depot of material where you would store the material. And they also have the same, like, or they have like a similar approach, a different approach for already existing things. So that's also how they started. They started with um, understanding existing structures and asking the client who would commission them to give them like weeks to fully list the building and understand what you have already as an existing structure. Because this is what we are confronted with as architects also, um, how we deal with the existing. Um, so they would list the existing structure to fully understand the material potential they have in the existing structure and then develop a plan how you could reuse it. So it's not, I think that's like the interesting part is that this is not a plan they have for the future. They're like actively working as an office already like this. The question that interested us for 2038 is what would need to happen that this becomes a legislative framework as Nicolas put it and like a, a, a normative thinking in a way that it becomes kind of like the new normal how to act which changes the role of the architect also immediately because all of a sudden it's about caretaking it's about maintenance when you cannot demolish something and then it's trash and gone when you demolish something it's still there and you have to deal with what is still there so it changes our thinking enormously as architects if you add um technological uh, technological progress in terms of um well the well-known notion of internet of things you could you can assume that that every little piece of a building has as Olaf said its its identity you can basically trace it so there's a there's a different transparency also in terms of the information that no part of a building um, will be out of sight will not be forgotten like it or um, not yeah and um, the in 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 the little chat window um, um uh, one of the uh, guests um, obviously mentions, you know, the life cycle. These are ideas that are very, uh, um, they're already around, um, especially mm. also in design. Um, yeah. uh, it's obviously a different question for an architect. Um, I looked at the website uh, that you mentioned, Olaf, um, from this project, um, this, uh, what is it called? Um, uh, this ma no, ma no, yeah, this material, um, uh, where, where the um, buildings um, should be um, listed, uh, you know, with the material that has been used. It looks very much like a, a site from a real estate uh, um, profile, you know, you immediately become a bit, uh, I, I, I was a bit, um, uh, how do you say? Um, Just yeah, like, um, you know, I, I, I thought of architects immediately as like functionnaire, you know, uh, so they need to go look at a database, uh, you know, to, to see which material is available, how you can collect it. Um, I mean, you know, obviously the, the design process would uh, change dramatically. Um, I know that uh, the Office B Plus uh, works or tries to work, you know, with the regulations. That's what you, why you mentioned, I think, also, Nikolaus, you know, this legis uh, le yeah. legislation, um, you know, as, a, as something that um, enables you also for a creative process. Um, yeah. But, you know, the aesthetics that is provided here is, um, you know, uh, it doesn't uh, you, kind of attract you, right? You're, you're um, clearly underwhelmed by the aesthetics. And um, I guess, but I think... The, this is why, why Olaf said that there are, we were taking up uh, certain elements from, from the now, from people who are practicing now or in the past few years and kind of extrapolate this to the future or look back from the future, assuming certain changes and advances. And I think one, one of these um, things that we probably still underestimate is the, the, the sheer force of of technology here because I think that, that today in a, in a younger generation of architects uh, I think scripting became a normality yeah, so I think if you combine uh, scripting and these rather abstract catalogs as you said of of uh, these kind of classic toolboxes in a way that is tax aesthetics and combine it with with scripting and, and a much more creative um, method in a way or also in terms of experimentation 
uh, then we then you get another aesthetic. We we don't provide this aesthetic in our film. We of course we ask ourselves a bit: Would we propose designs like a building? How does a building look like in 2038? This is something we, we don't do. We we give we give constant glimpses, fragments of it, but we don't see um, the role of the German pavilion or, or, or our contribution as a design proposal in, in a very direct sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there are drawings, right? Also in, the, in this newspaper, um, yeah. uh, there's, there's sketches, um, yeah. simulations. Um, and interestingly, interestingly, the second um, topic that we chose for, to, for tonight um, is kind of contradicting what you're saying um, because you uh, now say, um, you know, um, imply that uh, technology could be of, you know, big use. Um, the the project, the second project, uh, associated with Bau Botanik, um, kind of leaves technology completely out um, and suggests. Um, um, and I hope you can explore this now um, better than me. Um, suggests that we should just let it grow, right? Um, Olaf Nikolaus. Um. Yeah, I think the interesting aspect, and we will watch a little video so that everyone like uh, like a glimpse also out of the interviews. Um, the the second approach has this strong momentum also to accept the idea that maybe architects do not know how things will end up. No, so this idea of us being the master planners who develop a project that is also because of our discipline as architects or urban planners or landscape architects, no, always related to a time span and always related to a vision already, no, because when we work as architects, we always think of the future and hopefully think that everything will work out. So this is given to our um, profession in a way. Um, the, the idea that Bau Botanik and others we interviewed follow is that there are moment, moments in a planning process or in architecture where you do not have the full control and where you let nature take over partially um, and uh, let the things grow and develop by themselves. I will share the screen again to watch um, another clip that explores this topic. Back in, in 2020, we had this mainstream understanding of something is um, ecologically valuable if it saves energy. So if it has the minimal interaction with the outside. So that, that where all these uh, isolated boxes came from. You can remember these classical architectural forms with thick walls uh, where nothing should go through. But this was the main focus like a, like a strict corridor and um, you have to protect the building from the environment and you have to protect the inside to lose energy to the outside and this um was i mean that was that was actually hundreds of years yes it was the tradition of architecture to protect us from from the surrounding from the nature and so but it came to a certain peak yeah. until it collapsed until we understood yeah, when they had to had tear to these houses down, down and had yeah. to recycle all this plastic and then they realized it's, it's no use you know it, actually it's a system and we can't close the circle it's not possible <laughs> We've made no distinction between the landscape and housing. They've become one kind of environment, thanks to advances in synthetic biology over the last 20 years, we were able to make that happen. We were able to grow trees into specified geometries to make all kinds of geometric shapes and structures that actually work for human programmatic environments. And that took some time, but we were really successful. We're actually looking at different materials that were grown in labs. I mean, I'm sitting right now in a chair that was grown in a lab. It's pretty fantastic. It took years to develop, but it's really practical. The advantage to it is that when we're done with this chair, we throw it into a garden and it feeds thousands of other forms of life. When we are designing 
today for other species, we take the other species quite serious, like, like a client who's also paying for um, the building. And we are integrating the living spaces of these animals, for example, into the built envelope. And we are also taking care that, for example, there's enough food supply. And this is um, designed in a circular way that the whole life cycle of um, these different animals and also plants um, is addressed. We the people have changed. We the people now do what we want to do and take responsibility for where we are. Finally, we came to the realization that our human presence cannot be taken for granted. Nor the presence of the butterflies, the trees, even the worms in the soil. It's very astonishing that architects thought for the separation and for the for the for the building as an object. Yes. So that's, and the result was that when we wanted to go out to enjoy nature, we were always trying to reach the boundary of a city. A lot of these systems that we're looking at in the city that we experience now in 2038 actually came about through many different arguments over time on how to make cities adaptable, regenerative, and resilient. These were terms that we used in design and actually happened. Some cities had changed and were super successful. In other areas, something very different happened. That was essentially a crisis. And we needed that crisis because without it, without witnessing what could happen in Europe and the United States, the direct damage caused from the changing in climate dynamics without watching what happened to some of those economies, we wouldn't have created the change that's happened now. So it took that massive kind of upsetting moment to create the kind of energy we needed and political will to create the change that we have in our civilization that's now civilization 2.0. So we got through that crisis. It was horrible to see it, but it was kind of necessary for us to get off our asses and make that kind of change. Okay, questions? Um, yeah, um, what did we just see? <laughs> Obviously, my, my initial question was very wrong. Uh, it's not about uh, the growth is, uh, is, has, uh, is uh, made possible through technology, um, yeah. as far as I understand. Um, um, yeah, please uh, explore on this, um, on, on what we just saw. I think the, 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 the principles in a way what, what they said is um, that this dichotomy between um, architecture and nature is something that that is highly problematic and that would that has to be overcome in a way, and this also impl this implies two things in terms of also architectural production is that a very accurate understanding. Also, they they talked about geometry, so it's also about drawing, redrawing, trying to understand the system of things, of plants, vegetation, animals as well. So so I think it's it's about somehow weaving one area into the other two areas that were highly distinct uh, historically in in architecture and so i think that's one element and it's based on on technological skills clearly and because it's it's an engineering skill skill and the other element for me here is that that it's we that nature whether it's animals, plants, humans as part of it are uh, also to be understood as legal entities. You know, it's not, I think this, this whole opposition between these two areas is something that we think will, uh, will change from the perspective of 2038. 
yeah Olaf you wanna yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I mean it's like a topic that kind of like uh, bridges to also the interest of our office but also to what we do since last semester at ETH um, there we call it cohabitation in the video you saw like um, these were actually all architects practicing architects but like on different um, in different scales so Caroline Neve and um, the uh, woman in uh, like half of the clip she is talking uh, from the perspective as like a professional who works in Amsterdam for the city and they try to implement something um, called multi-species urbanism um, at ETH or our semester topic is called cohabitation which also comes from this idea of how can um, can nature become an active political agent? How can we deal with the rights of nature in the design process? And how does it influence the buildings we do? Um, as a skill set, as Nico described it, um, it's extremely important because we all are facing the changes right now. We are all aware of it. But right now, we are still in a moment where we would design buildings in a way that they should not harm nature. So there are kind of like laws that would regulate that you are not allowed to extinct the species. But what all of these like interview partners are aiming for is actively changing the way we design so that you would enable nature to coexist and co-inhabit not only the cities, but every building. So there's also like a study that frames that in like a facade in the city, you have now like a higher biodiversity than on like agricultural monocultural land on the countryside. So it's also this question of how can the city become like a space of cohabitation and coexisting, again, dealing with the existing structures, but also with new buildings. And um, so I think that as a topic is extremely interesting um, because it's something that we have to actively change in the way we teach or practice. Um, and I think it's also very interesting that, for instance, the German architecture chamber, they also um, released or like, uh, published a paper called Haus der Erde, where they also asked the question, what will an architect do in the future? Because we have built already so much, kind of like th there's always this claim that we already built enough for humanity no, to live. Um, so how do you deal with the existing, um, how do you adapt it in order to achieve this how Caroline Nevea puts it, multi-species urbanism, or Daniel um, Schönle and Van Ludwig as this uh, cohabitation. Yeah, it's, I think there are also phenomena, recent phenomena where um, basically our human-centered perspective is, is changing drastically. So who, have, who would have imagined uh, years ago that an um, Orang Utan would fight a, a right, a really a juridical uh, case. Of course, it, you have to replace him and to, to find entities to stand for the Orang Utan because the two languages don't match. But, uh, or uh, recently, a river in, in New Zealand um, went to court. How do we do this? It's, you know, you, you need to basically uh, put these questions also into legal questions, have to transform them. And, um, and I think to combine very scientific, very, very engineering approaches with legal questions, I think this is for us and, and democratic issues. I think this is for us a key point here where we insist or kind of, it's, I think the whole film and contribution for Venice is also a certain player for uh, expertise so it's not there, there might be a certain romantic impetus here but i think it's, a, it's also very um, i think optimistic clear for uh, certain expertise of doing things yeah i mean um you know if i if i can play the uh devil's advocates um here maybe a little you bit must. um yeah um uh, i remember the documenta uh, back in 2012 um when caroline christoph bakajiev um was famously quoted you know that strawberries um have uh, can think as well and dogs um are, have the uh, the same as men basically so she already established right this yeah kind of post-humanistic um, uh, idea of um, uh, cohabitation, I guess. Um, 
Um, and at the time, uh, you know, she was either declared as crazy or esoteric. Um, and obviously one of the reasons no. that um, people, um, yeah, I mean, at least in mainstream media, you know, um, it was uh, people were laughing also about this. And um, one of the reasons, um, you know, out of, which comes out of a certain pragmat pragmat pragmatic mind, obviously, is the question of who commissions what. Uh, so yeah. it's nice, you know, that we listen to the bee and the butterfly. Um, my heart opens like right away. However, a bee is not uh, commissioning a building, um, right? Uh, so yeah, how, but... how, how, how should we envision this? Um, I mean, what you just mentioned as well, you know, makes us think uh, forensic architecture is already working, you know, they are defending land mm. also in, in, you know, mm. in the name of UNESCO heritage. They're very successful in doing this. However, it is also an NGO, you know, they are affiliated to a university. And if we compare this to like the market, you know, the big, big market, I think all of you have a list as well prepared, you know, of the big players, um, the architecture firms. Isn't this like a nice, you know, uh, fairy tale that you are talking about? Um, how, well, how, how, how can you know? We, we speak from perspective of 2038. But um, to be uh, serious about this, I think the, it's interesting your remark um, putting us back to um, Pauline Bakaviev's uh, documenta. And she was clearly referring, I think, to, to Pierre Hugues' work, which I think was probably the strongest in the whole documenta then. And Pierre Hugues' work, I think it's, it's quite interesting. He, also how his work continued. I think he, he, um, he really combines um, artificial intelligence or an interest in artificial intelligence with um, basically the, um, the introduction of, of, of animals or, or another world, the nature as a world. So I think it's something that maybe from today's perspective in 2020 is still quite difficult to grasp. I acknowledge that also for me um, to, to somehow uh, rely and to, to combine um, this non-human, post-human uh, phenomena with technology, because this is actually what, what what's happening. If you if you take artificial intelligence into the game, then it becomes a very complex constellation, and it's quite quite clear that. Um, no, I mean it, obviously it won't, it's a... it won't be a mystery, and so I think it's not a fairy tale. It's actually it. I think all what we discuss also has a very um, dark side, which is total transparency, control, dictatorship, but, uh, data. But do you think artificial intelligence is also able to uh, make communication between the bee and the human being possible? Yeah, maybe they're better equipped than we are as humans. Yeah, because I think that's the problem that we still cannot fully understand each other. And even yeah. like on a documenta, I mean, this piece is done by um, Pierre Yuk, right? That's because somebody was asking which piece you were mentioning. I saw. Um, yeah, Pierre Yuk. Yeah. I just I just wrote it down in the chat uh, window. Yeah. No, but obviously, uh, Nikolaus, yes, uh, technology is great. You know, I, I totally agree. Um, however, um, um, what I also ask is who commissions this? Um, sure. who, who gives the money? Yeah. Um, yeah. Olaf, maybe you can show this famous list uh, <laughs> that you, yeah. um, that yeah. I love, that I also like so much. Um, I mean, I think like uh, one thing is that they don't say we build a house for the bees exclusively. They like the way that uh, Baubotanik would argue or argues in our clip is then also they would say there's a legislation which forces you. No, it's like a legislation. You have to fulfill it that when you newly build, you also build for the others. So it's not exclusively human centered. You think of like both parties. I don't think it's like an it's not a conflict of like, these are our interests and these are the others. Maybe it is until now, but there are a lot of examples also that we discussed with the interview partners where you can see that this idea of coexistence, and when you talk to Caroline Neve and how they implemented in Amsterdam on an urban level, it's like very pragmatic, um, a very pragmatic architectural approach, like with planting and green zones. So it might sound so abstract if you think of the growing 
a mushroom mycelium chair, you know, then you immediately like, oh my God, biology and everything. And then also the AI discussion, but it already starts now, like with very simple architectural tools. And the question is, how could this develop further? Then what you ask with the, with the list of the um, 100 offices, and this is something that Antje and I already talked uh, about a lot. Um, and we also talked about in the preparation of this maybe to put it next to it, this letter that uh, Jacques Herzog wrote to David Chipperfield. No, I took like a screenshot of this, uh, like kind of the start of the letter that Jacques Herzog wrote to him. And then next to it, this list of the 100, um, and then it's already the question how it's framed, biggest, most successful architecture companies that are maybe not even discussed in schools. So the discourse we have and the experts we use as references and maybe role models, um, and it's I think the, list. Uh, these two go very well together because Jacques Herzog also addresses this uh, to David Chipperfield that architects cannot change the whole system and the world and do everything because architects always tended to build for the rich or for particular systems, um, very like, uh, selected projects. And then you can compare this to this list of the 100 offices you can all find them online. That's the one from 2015 I found. And then it's the question like, who do we know as a bubble who is claiming to be intellectual, discussing the reality of the world? And then you have this list of the 100 offices with these revenues in, um, in billions. And you actually from this 100 offices, you know very little of them. No, and I think that's like the, the point that you want to make, Antje, and I totally agree. The question is like who commissions and who pays for it and how can we finance this? I think what we do today, taking these two topics and themes, um, and there are two other topics that you cannot leave out. I mean, that's the, that's the beauty of 2038 and uh, the dilemma of today that everything is connected. So the other two topics, um, like different economic models that are needed to finance this architecture and to rediscuss ownership and the other topic of like technology, which we also did not like fully address today. It's always this complexity of these four topics together that you actually need to understand 2038, but then you're also confused. I mean, that's like the momentum we are in now. But it's interesting, uh, since you were just showing Jacques Herzog's answer to David Chipperfield's question. Maybe you, uh, you can you explain shortly what this was? I don't know if everybody is aware uh, what happened there. Uh, Nikolov, maybe you can explain quickly. Yeah, actually, Olaf showed it to me. I, I, I wasn't aware of this, but uh, apparently um, uh, David Chipperfield in his function as, a, as an editor of um, Domus magazine asked uh, a number of architects about yeah, their, their perception their, about the role of architects within the ongoing current crisis, whether it's climatic and social, political, etc. And Jacques Herzog uh, answered in quite a probably very, very realistic, maybe also a bit dark way uh, about the powerlessness of uh, of architects and also the, the compromitation very oft and yeah, the kind of compromise you you do as an architect because you have the wrong clients since you were talking aren't you about about uh, the client um because traditionally as uh, Jacques Herzog said um the best projects probably if you think about the renaissance were uh, palazzi by uh by rich people in Florence and aristocrats, um, or uh, churches, also partly problematic. So, um, but well, I personally think, of course, there's a certain truth in this, but on the other hand, there are other uh, traditions in architecture as well, which uh, are very complicated. So I think this whole humanitarian impetus that you could see maybe from the mid 19th century onwards uh, in in the history of architecture, it's it's something that to take very seriously. Of course, it was maybe for some people 
another trick to get interesting commissions uh, from from the from state funded organizations uh, for public housing etc um, but this was a rather recent uh, invention by architects that they could actually also take care of all the misery that was around maybe uh, for instance in the mid 19th century victorian england yeah in the in the in the really poor areas of london which was one of the first movements where where this was brought up and of course it's a complicated story where also very contradictory uh, where architects try to improve things and to to help uh, disprivileged uh, people but i think there this is a history that exists so i think one one can also build upon that so i i'm in that sense uh, less probably uh, i understand what jacques herzog was saying but i think it, he drew on one particular area and of course it also reflects maybe part of his practice but i think there are other practices in architecture yeah i mean maybe we can integrate one of the questions here um i don't know if you see it uh, olaf uh, nikolaus um yeah um, you know, he is also um, a comment um, that mentions, you know, the history of these kind of projects. Um, yeah. um, here's a whole earth catalog from the 70s. Obviously, in the 70s, there were a lot of these ideas. Yeah. Buckminster Fuller is also, you know, always a reference to these uh, big ideas. Um, yeah. Um, what's the difference? Um, this is one of the questions that was asked um, to your project. Um, or is it similar, you know, in the, in the spirit? I think I think there's a certain similarity, I guess, but it, I think the whole Earth catalog also shows, of course, the some somehow the, the tricks a little bit and also the, the problems because you could also can also clearly draw certain lines from the whole Earth catalog to to uh, to uh, uh, contemporary tech companies, yeah, like a, a line from whole, all the all, the whole Earth catalog to Steve Jobs, where this whole thing. Why? Becomes, becomes a bit dark. Yeah, it's, well, there, there are certain there, there are clearly links between tech culture and uh, hippie culture. Mm. Yeah, so, so I think there is a certain there, there, there are similar motifs in a way. And of course, these things, if they meet high capitalism, uh, things went maybe a bit wrong, or they went very well for some people. But for others, uh, I think there's a, probably some democratic defi deficit. And that's also something we address uh, in, in the pavilion with our work. I think that there's another question, which I find very interesting from Ole Fischer here about the rights of nature, um, uh, basically describing a, um, a conflict between first societies and native cultures. And it's clearly, I think this is an interesting, uh, very important aspect is this question, who speaks? I think this is an old problem. If you, also within humanitarian architecture or so-called humanitarian architecture that speaking on behalf of others is a is a problem so so one of the 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 challenges will be um, a different planning culture and also to be very careful with speaking so i think this we, we think in a way with also with 2038 that um the the whole balance between clients, users, um, makers, designers uh, have to change and will be much more complex with much more feedback. It's funny, right? I mean, um, you are you are proposing a future. It's uh, two thousand thirty-eight, but you are four men um, in the as curators. Uh, you know, it's yeah. uh, apropos who's speaking for who, yeah. and uh, in terms of diversity, how did that happen? No, we, are, we are clearly an example of 2020. That's maybe why we, why we are doing 2038. And uh, so, so it tries to speculate on, on that future. And that this was clearly also uh, a reason why, uh, if you look at sort of the protagonists of, of our film, and they, they, they are really um, the voices here, uh, because we, we also see ourselves as, a, as giving the, the platform, certainly for people like like Andre Tang and others. Um, there's a there's certainly a majority, a female majority, and, and uh, also other 
genders. Um, but it's, it's certainly an issue that we are totally aware of. And it's um, nothing we can change in, in short time uh, that we are four men, four white men. Um, but it's, it's something that where we are clearly aware of the fact that we um, represent very much the ongoing uh, system in a way in 2020. Olaf, maybe you want to respond to the um, to the comments. Uh, it's we're getting close to the closing time. Um, Olaf, do you see what? Um, it's in the it's in the chat or in the Q and A. In the yeah. chat. In the chat. One second. Ah, yeah, there are so many comments. I'm sorry, I didn't see this before. Yeah, the, 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 the before we, we clarified the befores, but here now now it's about the ego culture. Yeah, I mean, the last point, uh, this is a very valuable comment. I also recommend to read this letter by Jacques Herzog, which I think is like an amazing letter also for um, young practitioners to get like a glimpse in the reality of someone who is running a gigantic business. So I think that he also, maybe this is what Nico also mentioned, arguing out of his perspective also has a responsibility for a lot of people he's paying or they are paying. So I think you also have this momentum of these big companies that have thousands of employees that they would argue differently regarding the question of ego, um, which is also addressed in the letter. That's why I mention it again. Um, I think there is certainly a change happening right now because all, like I'm 33 years old. I think there's like a, a, there's a different momentum. No? This promise of like, suffering, working the whole night, building this first amazing project that will make you famous and then you're a star architect. I think that this, this myth is not the thing that we are aiming for anymore. Of course, there are still people who want to become like a star architect or however you call this, but I think there's like a cultural change that also has to do um, with the way offices are run, with the way we structure offices, we are also now in the refounding. It's a big topic, to our, like a huge topic. Um, how can we structure um, this new practice that it functions differently in terms of economic and how do we deal? And maybe there's a relation to Nico's answer and your question before. How do we deal with this idea that the, the, the one asking the question is always asking for one name or one face? or like maybe it's two maximum, if they're equally famous, then you mention both names. Um, but this is also something that we were confronted or are confronted with regularly that they say, but how is this possible that you are this gigantic group? Give us one name, who can we talk to? Totally clear, you need someone who speaks and communicates, that's all fine. But it also has to do with this idea of the ego and the one star architect who has this idea and leads everything. That's not how we are structured. And I also don't think that architectural practices will function this way because it will be more interdisciplinary. If we look in all these topics and want to integrate them, there's not one person who can deal with all of this. And I think this topic of decentralization also in terms of like who speaks and who owns and who runs is like a huge, is like a huge topic to come. We did a whole semester at ETH um, about how an alternative office structure could look like. It was like very interesting to see that the students said like, we are so interested in finding other ideas, how we can start a practice after studies, no? That there is not this weird moment of like utopia in studies and then highly economic pragmatism in practice. Like what are alternative models? There have been a lot of comments on the letter of Chuck Herzog that this is also the decision you can also choose to have a smaller practice and not build the gigantic stadiums so it's also like what you decide to do i think it's also interesting the um, i'm remembering again this uh list of the biggest architect firm uh, that you just showed olaf is there is actually another list uh it's a list i know from the us uh, from a research project at Buell Center at Columbia University, where Gensler, which was top one with one billion, it's actually one of the smaller ones. It's the companies that they in the US call A&I, it's architecture and engineering 
A and E architecture and engineering firms. And and I think this what's interesting there is actually that is this um, weaving of typically architectural um, expertise and engineering expertise. I think that's also something that I think we all know a bit that architects today are very uh, reduced to a particular role. Yeah, we are probably are allowed to do a nice as wrapping a kind of facade over a structural system and an engineering system that we don't control because it's uh, we are not very often quite unrelated to. So it's handed over, or a lot of expertise is handed over to other consultants. Uh, but there are office structures that are much, much bigger that try to integrate a lot and to, to connect a lot of different practices. And maybe that's... In, that sense in a, in a more transdisciplinary way, also what can be done on a much smaller scale, together with uh, new relationships to clients, uh, very different types of clients, to legislation, uh, to, um, as we think, very urgent, uh, also democratic reforms and reforms on land. That's, that's another big topic. And one of the comments here um, in the chat is, um, you know, criticizing uh, that uh, before, you know, we should uh, pay tribute to a bee. Uh, obviously, this is also very quite cynical formulation, but um, we should uh, house first uh, people. And before building a house for bees, we should build houses for humans because the comment, I, I just saw that there was a comment that all the people watching cannot see the questions. So that's why the question is only 2% of architects are doing housing. Maybe let's do some houses for people before uh, talking to the bees. I would also say uh, you can do just both. No, it's not either or. You can, like if the legislation, the mindset changes, let's do both. Are there more questions? Maybe this is also a great closing. This this was maybe a great closing question. We are um, it's time to somehow have get off and <laughs> do something else. <laughs> but um, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. And also, I'm super looking forward to see the biennial physical. And I think it's. Um, Somehow I was, I think it's also great, great that we have this time now to talk about it before we actually see it and that there's so much discussion going on beforehand. It's like, um, I also wonder if it, it, if it will change now during the time and if you are still working on it to transform it because also time, time is changing of course and maybe um, puts up different topics again. I mean, also to confinement topics and whatever, but um, maybe this would be a topic for next time. Oh, what? Maybe one comment, like in the in the very first trailer, there was uh, Evgeny Morozov said like a sentence, we developed a society that is not obsessed with competition. So when we showed this trailer, which was done like pre-corona, no? Like in December, January. Funny enough, this sentence was like one of the sentences where everyone said, this is so naive and ridiculous. This will never happen. We will always be like a society, uh, like obsessed with competition. No way that this changes. And it's like so interesting that half a year later, when you show it to people, this is the sentence where they don't struggle anymore because of COVID-19, the whole system changes. And now all by a sudden, six months later, it's like the discussion we are, we are like facing in the media every day, like how to reform the system. So I think this is something that, we should kind of like realize that the black swan, this one thing that changes everything, could come any time, no? And I think this is like very interesting um, also to keep in mind that things that might seem unrealistic can, sadly enough, we experience this now, become very fast reality. I think that's yeah. very but it's also great to say another last word that um, your co contribution puts up so many models which are just really positive and that they are solution oriented. And that's that just, um, yeah, also I think um, for architects, 
gives uh, it gives it a lot of hope for architects again. So that's also contradict to um, Jack Herzog, no? <laughs> so everybody from um, far away and close again, I think I will we will go and leave you and wish you a very good evening and hope to see you next time again on our last talk, which I forgot when it, when it was, it was in November, but we will inform you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, bye.